Neurons are cells that are unique to the nervous system. They have the special ability to generate and propagate electrical impulses called action potentials. These electrical events occur across the cell membrane of a neuron. So before we can get to the details of an action potential, we need to remind ourselves of the properties and structure of the cell membrane. So if we were to pick a spot on the cell membrane and zoom in real close to a section, we might see something like this. The cell membrane is a mosaic composed primarily of two layers of phospholipids with other molecules embedded throughout. We will be interested in the protein gates and pumps that we find in the membrane. The important property of the cell membrane as it applies to neurons and action potentials is that the cell membrane is selectively permeable, which means it lets some things through but not all things. So we're going to use this up close diagram of the cell membrane and show how some particles might be able to get through the cell membrane and other particles might be might be denied and not be able to get through unless they have special channels accessing them uh, letting them go through. Some types of particles that definitely have a really hard time getting through the cell membrane are ions, both positively and negatively charged ions. The two ions that play a role in action potentials are sodium and potassium. For a neuron at rest, we have many sodium ions outside the neuron and only a few inside and we have many potassium inside and only a few outside. So we have an uneven distribution of ions across the membrane. This results in a voltage difference across the membrane. We also have large negatively charged anions stuck on the inside of the membrane. So if we were to measure the voltage difference across the membrane, we'd find that the, the value of that difference across the membrane is negative 70 millivolts. So the value is 70 millivolts with the inside being more negative and the outside being slightly more positive. We call this value the resting potential and it's a, dis a very definite negative 70 millivolts. Why do we call this potential? Well, there's the potential to do work. Just like water trapped behind a dam, the sodium ions would like to move down their concentration gradient and the potassium ion would like to move down their concentration gradient. If given the chance, the ions will move. Let's look at how they might move. Since they are charged particles, and charged particles don't move through the bilipid layer very well, we have to rely on protein channels and gates. In the cell membrane of the neuron, we have three important kinds of channels. We have sodium channels, potassium channels, and a sodium-potassium pump. The sodium channels have gates that are sensitive to stimulation and gates that are sensitive to voltage changes. Potassium pumps have gates that are voltage sensitive gates and the pota sodium potassium pumps work with the help of ATP to move materials against the concentration gradient in an active transport. Now we're going to look at the steps leading up to and through an action potential. We're going to look at this in two ways. We're going to look at what happens here at the cell membrane and what's happening with the voltage change as we go through the process of getting to and running through an action potential. So if we start with the membrane at rest with the ions distributed as such, we know that we're at a resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. If there's some stimulus, some of the stimulus-sensitive voltage gates would open, allowing some sodium to come into the cell. As the sodium comes into the cell, the voltage changes. The inside becomes less negative. As the voltage becomes less negative, we're coming closer to threshold potential. If there's not quite enough stimulus, then the voltage will come back to its resting potential, and no active potential will fire. If, however, there's more stimulus and more of these gates open, and more sodium is allowed to come into the, uh, the neuron, then our resting potential, uh, or our membrane potential, will get closer to reaching threshold. If there's enough stimulus, such that enough sodium gates open, such that the voltage across the membrane reaches a certain value, in this case negative 55, we begin a sequence of events that's going to run to completion, an all or nothing action called an, uh, called an event called an action potential. As more sodium moves across the membrane inside, the polarity or the voltage difference across the membrane is going to change. As we move from negative 70 to negative 65 to negative 60 to negative 55, when we hit this value, the threshold potential, all of the voltage sensitive gates, sodium gates open at one time 
and sodium comes flooding in to the neuron. This influx of sodium causes a very fast, very steep depolarization phase to the action potential as the voltage changes from negative 55 and quickly hits all the way up to, to positive 30 millivolts. Once the voltage across the membrane reaches positive 30 millivolts, all of the sodium channels will shut and the potassium channels will open. Once the potassium channel is open, potassium is going to rush out of the cell down its concentration gradient. As these positive charges are leaving, the voltage difference across the membrane starts to move back negative in a repolarization event. If we look at the graph, we'll see this happening. A very fast depolarization event as the potassium rush back out of the cell move, and we're bringing the membrane potential back towards the resting potential of negative 70. However, when we hit negative 70, potassium gates start to shut, but they shut slowly. And so we actually overshoot our resting potential. As we hit positive 30 millivolts, potassium gates shut and our resting potential is restored. At this point, we're back to our negative 70 millivolts, but however, if we look at the distribution of ions, we're not back at the beginning. The sodium are now in and the potassium are out, and we need to fix that in order to put the water behind the dam or to reload the gun to fire again. With the help of energy from ATP, the sodium potassium pumps push the ions back to their starting positions and restore our concentration of ions our uneven distribution of ions to restore our initial condition. This time during which the sodium potassium pumps are working to restore the ion concentrations is called the refractory period. So to recap, a neuron at rest has a resting potential of negative 70 millivolts due to the uneven distribution of ions across the membrane with more sodium out and more potassium in the inside is more negative than the outside. Upon stimulation gates will open that allow sodium to come into the membrane, slowly depolarizing the membrane, rising the membrane from negative 70 towards negative 55. If we reach the threshold potential of negative 55 millivolts, all the sodium gates will open and a massive influx of sodium will begin the action potential. As the sodiums rush in, the membrane uh, charge, the potential across the membrane, quickly goes from negative 55 to positive 30, at which time the sodium gates shut and the potassium gates open. The potassium starts rushing back out, restoring the membrane potential back to its original polarity of negative 70. As we reach negative 70, the potassium gates begin to shut. However, they shut a little bit slow so that we actually overshoot our original resting potential and go slightly lower than negative 70. At the end, it's up to the sodium potassium pumps to move the ions back to their original positions. To recap again, if we have stimulation, sodium gates open and we depolarize the membrane. If we depolarize to reach threshold of negative 55 millivolts, all the sodium gates open. And we have our depolarization phase of the action potential. Once we reach a voltage of positive 30 millivolts, the sodium gates shut, the potassium gates open, and we begin our repolarization phase. When we return to our negative 70 millivolts resting potential, the sodium gates will shut and our sodium potassium pumps begin to restore the ions back to the, the starting sides of the membrane. And during this time, called the refractory period, that patch of membrane cannot fire again. Now all the events we just described were local. They occurred at a single spot on the cell membrane. So if that action potential happened here, it happened only here. But we talk about action potentials traveling. So we have an action potential, and we talk about it generating and traveling down the dendrites, through the cell body, and then being sent down the axon. However, thinking about an action potential traveling is not the right way to think about it. In fact, it's better that we think about an action potential regenerating. So that if we have an action potential starting here, we need a new one here, and then a new one here, and a new one here, and so forth. So it's not a singular action potential involved in a neuron sending a signal. It's many action potentials regenerating over and over and over again. We call this regeneration of action potential and the movement of the message, message through the neuron and down the axon propagation.
if this is the membrane, whoops, or rather, if this is the membrane, and we divide it into sections, and we talk about each section being a localized space, all the events of the action potential occurred right here. When the action potential occurs here, it stimulates the neighboring patch of membrane to initiate its own action potential. That patch of membrane stimulates the next patch of membrane to initiate its, its action potential. And the signal regenerates itself over and over, propagating, moving down the axon. Question, how come the signal can't go backwards? Well, at the time in which this patch of membrane here is stimulating forward and backwards, this patch of membrane is at what stage? It's in its refractory period. And during that brief amount of time when it's resetting, putting the ions back to the right sides of the membrane, for that instant of time, it can't fire. In a very short time after that, we would be reset, ready to fire, but at that time, this patch of membrane is in its refractory period and no longer stimulating. By the time this one gets reset, the message has moved one patch of membrane beyond, and this one's in refractory and so forth, and you can see that the actin potential can only travel one direction, out from its source, and never back on itself. Now the actin potential is described as an all-or-nothing event, meaning you can't have a small actin potential, or a slow one, or, or a hard one, or a faster one. It is very much like the analogy of shooting a gun. When you pull that trigger, if you pull a little bit, you might not fire the gun. But if you reach a certain amount of pressure, that gun's going to fire. And once you fire it, you can't unfire it. It's going to go from beginning to end to completion, and there's no stopping it. And that's how active potentials are. They're all or nothing events. You either have one or you don't. You can't have a strong one one time and then a weak one another time. It's always the same. So the question is, when we talk about nervous systems and sending signals, how do we differentiate between a strong signal and a weak signal? It's not the strength of the active potential or the size of the active potential. It will have to do with the number of active potential sent or the number of neurons recruited to send those signals uh, and, and things of that nature. We have one last thing to review as we talk about the propagation of the active potential down the neuron, and that's what happens to neuron or axons that are myelinated. Here's an axon with a myelin sheath of individual Schwann cells. And as the action potential is generated down this axon, this, the presence of a myelin sheath actually speeds up the rate of transmission. There are gaps between these cells called nodes of Ranvier. And as we move down the axon, an action potential will fire here. It will skip this section, and a new action potential will fire here, and we get to skip this section. And this type of propagation is called saltatory propagation. We're somersaulting or jumping across from one node of Ron VA to the next node of Ron VA. Um, and that speeds up the rate of action potential transmission down the axon. Now, not all axons are myelinated, but uh, most of the axons out in the body are myelinated. And this myelin sheath insulates um, with these Schwann cells and speeds up the propagation of the action potential down the neuron. So that does it for our review on action potentials and uh, the propagation of action potentials. Look over your notes, watch the video, and bring any questions you have into class. Thanks.